The Saskatchewan government says its plans for a billion-dollar irrigation mega-project in Saskatchewan are, quote, affordable. An official made that claim after the province released a report analyzing the costs and benefits of the Lake Diefenbaker Irrigation Project. However, economists consulted by CBC have come to a different conclusion based on that very same report. And so today we'll hear from those economists and we'll get reaction from Sask Irrigation. And in the second half of the show, we'll expand the conversation and talk about what issues are getting enough attention during election season when it comes to agriculture. You can join the conversation after 12.30 today by calling 1-800-716-2221. You can also email right now, bluesky at cbc.ca. The CBC's Jeff Leo has been digging into the economic feasibility of the Diefenbaker Irrigation Mega Project, and he brought the long-awaited report from the provincial government to several economists to get their take. He spoke to Morning Edition host Stephanie Langenegger about the report and what it means. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> excuse me. It's it's uh, it's analyzing the government's plans for this 1.15 billion dollar uh, irrigation project so to build irrigation infrastructure in the Lake Diefenbaker and the plan there is to irrigate 90,000 acres of farmland. So this is ditches and pumps and that sort of thing in order to get water to private land owned by farmers so they can irrigate their crops. So how many farmers? So the government says it doesn't know and it really hasn't made those calculations, but some math you can do on the back of a napkin can give you a basic idea. So an average Saskatchewan farm is 1,800 acres, 90,000 acres they want to irrigate. So we're talking about ballpark 50 farmers for this $1.15 billion project. So the question facing the government and taxpayers is this, does it make sense to spend $1.15 billion in order to give 50 farmers the opportunity to irrigate their farms. So to answer that question, the government hired the accounting firm KPMG to crunch the numbers. Here now is Patrick Boyle from the Water Security Agency talking about what their report found. I think what it means is, um, from our perspective, that we believe the project can move forward in a way that it could be economical for the province and the producers who are going to participate. So um, we're, we're going to continue down that path. Economical. Is yeah. that what the report shows? Well, so the report lays out three scenarios. You got your pessimistic scenario, your optimistic scenario, and then the one in the middle, the, which is they call it the base case. It's a more sort of conservative case, not crazy optimistic, not crazy pessimistic. That's the one I'm going to focus on. That's the one the report actually focuses on uh, too. So I'm going to give you some numbers here. Numbers don't work well on radio, they tell us, Steph, but follow with us if you I'm will. I'm listening. <laughs> okay. So $1.15 billion. Now, that project, the government says it's going to be paid by the government, but also by uh, an undetermined portion at this point will be paid by those farmers who want to participate. Uh, so the report says, in total, over the next 50 years, the province will create $5.9 billion, so almost $6 billion in economic activity, GDP, gross domestic product, that would not have happened if the project hadn't happened. And at the end of that 50 years, the Saskatchewan government, the main funder of the project, will have taken in a total of $410 million tax dollars. Okay. So... You spend more than a billion bucks, yeah. 1.15, yeah. and over 50 years, it generates nearly sixfold. That's six billion in yes. GDP for the province. Mm -hmm. And when we add it up after 50 years, it's generated an additional 410 million in tax for the province. Yeah. Is, yeah. is, is that good? Uh, well, so that's the question I put. I'm not an economist, Steph, but I went and talked to a couple of them. Uh, one of them was Ross Hickey. He's an economist at UBC. And he says, if you consider this project from the perspective of a private sector investment, you would stay away from this project. If we were evaluating this as sort of private investors, somebody was pitching this project to us. Like, like Dragon's Den? You'd say, no, <laughs> Dragon's Den, it wouldn't get on the air. <laughs> <laughs> you know they 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 filter out projects. You know what I you know what I mean in some sense before they 
air them, I think, on the CBC. And so I don't know if this one even get, look at the air. I don't think it would make it to broadcast. Well, because the, it, it costs today in real terms more money than the future lifetime value of benefits that come from the project. And so he says up front, the cost of the project, $1.15 billion, and at the end, 50 years from now, that 410 tax revenue. Uh, so he says, yeah, it certainly created a lot of ec- economic activity in the province, but that didn't ultimately benefit the Saskatchewan government, the main investor in the project. And so this report, does it come to any kind of conclusion? Well, well nothing explicitly. So it doesn't say, for example, that costs exceed benefits or benefits exceed costs, or it, it doesn't come to, it, it kind of lays out the, the numbers as we're talking about them. That strikes Peter Phillips as odd for a cost-benefit analysis report. He's um, a recently retired economics professor from the University of Saskatchewan. Before he was a professor, he was a senior economic advisor to the government of Saskatchewan in the 1980s and 1990s. And he evaluated many reports like this, including reports from KPMG. And he says, this report is surprisingly shy on details. He says, usually a report like this would have reams of detailed tables in the back showing the work of analysts, but that's not there. And he says, that's not the most striking omission. Normally, a cost-benefit analysis gives you the cost-benefit number. It's a ratio. (laughs) For one or under one. There's over one. All other things being equal, it's a candidate for investment. If it's under one, don't do it, is usually the rule. They never say that the, the benefit-cost ratio is X, which is usually what we hone in on, which makes you think that they're, they, it's low enough that they don't want to create a summative number like that. And so he says, uh, because of the <clears throat> vagueness of that report, it is difficult to draw many firm conclusions from it. Okay. The report talks, though, about mm-hmm. that economic activity you talked about, generating nearly $6 billion bucks in GDP. What do we know about that? Okay, so... The number comes from three key areas. So the first one is building the project. So that's the the pumps, the irrigation ditches, all the other infrastructure. And then also maintaining that infrastructure over uh, 50 years. So of the 6 billion, about 2 billion is that number. The other growth is the growth in crop production for farmers. The thing we're really kind of wanting to prime the pump on, right? The activity around that, like the transportation, the grain elevators, that will generate another $1 billion, a little more than that. And the remaining almost $3 billion, so almost half, will come from value-added processing. So that's saying... We're going to be growing a bunch more crops, and that's going to make food processing companies go, ooh, there's more crops, and they're going to move to the province, and they're going to set up shop so they can, in turn, process those, say, potatoes into French fries. Philip says, that sounds good on paper, but it rarely pans out. I think there's a lot of hope that, that you know, if we build this, they will come, and I'm never convinced that that's a great strategy. They've assumed that there will be some incremental growth across our, our food processing industry. But 74% of what they're going to produce, according to their analysis, is just wheat, canola, and lentils. And we don't have a shortage of wheat, canola, and lentils for further processing right now. So, Jeff, what is next for this project? So the government, uh, last we've heard, says it's moving ahead with it, planning for uh, construction in 2025. That's what the premier has said. Uh, So far, it has spent or committed about $30 million. So it's into this already uh, and plans to move forward, though it does say, look, we have more engineering work uh, to do to to figure out some of the details. Uh, Patrick Boyle from the Water Security Agency said the the, the best case scenario for the project, that's the optimistic case laid out in the report, says it will bring in $775 million in revenue for the province over the 50-year life of the project. That is, of course, still less than the total cost of the project. Peter Phillips says, generally speaking, big water projects like this around the world, so this is not partisan, this is just government, right? They're done poorly. (laughs) There's been analysis done. It doesn't work out well. What do they do? They often overestimate the benefits, underestimate the costs. In the case of water projects, generally, they underestimate them by 20%. 
Uh, he says the province needs to ask the question, is this the best way to spend a billion dollars to boost the economy? And Philip says he is not convinced that it is. Jeff, thank you very much. Jeff Leo speaking to Morning Edition host Stephanie Langenegger. For more on this story, you can find it still on our website or on the CBC News app. You can go to cbc.ca slash sask as one place to to read a bit more about that. I'm Lee Sugarbinski. This is Blue Sky. And today we're broadening the conversation a bit. Jeff Ewan is co-chair of Ir- Irrigation Saskatchewan. He farms at Riverhurst near Lake Diefenbaker. And he and other farmers in that area use irrigation. That was part of an earlier phase of the Lake Diefenbaker Irrigation Project. Jeff has been listening, and he joins us right now. Jeff, welcome back to Blue Sky. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I want to get your take on what you just heard. What's your initial reaction to Jeff's story? Yeah, no, uh, it's, it comes interesting to me for sure. I mean, we're talking big numbers, absolutely. But uh, I guess I've seen the growth of irrigation in our province in the time I've been around. Uh specifically locally, but also in the Outlook area where most of the irrigation resides around Lake Diefenbaker. And uh, certainly in recent years, we've seen a real uptick in the interest, uh, the changing of the crops, um, and really some value-added investment going there due to the fact that more irrigation is coming into play. And that's that's kind of when this announcement come about as an irrigator myself, but also seeing an industry kind of in its infancy that shouldn't be really at this point. I mean, we've been talking about irrigation in this province for over 100 years uh, from southwest times right through till when uh, the dam was built, which uh, one of the major pieces of why the dam was built was for irrigation. But we've never actually seen the full potential come to fruition. And, uh, and ultimately, when the announcement came through, it's well, this is, this is great news. Um, and like I said, some of the pessimism behind it. Yeah, it's big dollars. Um, but understand, too, that producers are putting money towards that as well. Uh, and there's a lot of communities at stake that would, would ultimately begin to thrive because of this investment. I want to back up just a little bit to give people a bit sure. more context, because it is big money. And you you say that farmers will contribute money in order to pay for this. So so maybe tell us about your farm, how you got irrigation, the price tag attached to that, like just kind of to give people a glimpse into how it's worked for you. Yeah, no, well, I mean, it's been a bit of an evolution. As far as at Riverhurst here, we're on a pressurized pumping system right off of Lake Diefenbaker. Uh, we're within an irrigation district, which was developed by the provincial government, uh, which is now currently owned by the irrigators. And we pay and operate all the expenses on that at this time. Yes, there is... Uh, you know, uh, um, some funding that comes through channels like previous announcements that we've heard about in cost sharing of infrastructure uh, for increased development, but also for maintaining and and whatnot of our project and replacement. So uh, as far as our farm goes, we've been doing it for about 15 years. We started by purchasing into some irrigated land. Uh, and then over the course of that time, we've continued to develop as much as we possibly could. So give, um, give me a sense of your return on investment. Like, wh- what has that enabled you to do that you wouldn't have been able to do with without an irrigation? Uh, well, it's tough to put a true number to it, honestly. I mean, agriculture is a very uh, risky business in the sense that, yes, we use figures and numbers to, to figure out year to year what we can do. But honestly, the irrigation is a, in my eyes, is a... Uh, a um a policy or not a policy sorry a uh, an opportunity that um gives or takes away the risk you know in southern saskatchewan rain is our biggest risk uh to growing a crop and it lets us make further decisions to grow not only more but also put the adequate amount of input into the crop to then grow it to its full potential and that, that is the hugest piece of what irrigation is but also diversification is a piece of that i mean we do have potato production in our area but also uh, we've become reliant on growing seed production crops as well. Uh, I mean, grains was brought up as going to be a major piece of of the new development, and certainly it will be. There is uh, rotational aspects of of farming that require growing cereal crops and pulse crops, but the specialty crops will come, and uh, and we've seen that in areas where irrigation has been developed in the past. So I just want to get back to the specifics in Jeff's report. So I appreciate the context that you've given. But what's what's your response if if economists say the the up the amount of money this is going to cost the province and looking at the return on investment and some are saying 
like the, the, the clip, you know, wouldn't pass the uh, test on Dragon's Den. How, how do you respond to that? Like how, when an economist says that, how do you take that? Yeah, well, and I'm certainly not an economist either. I mean, I run a business and, and figure with numbers, but the reality is assumptions. Uh, a lot of this is based on assumptions and certainly that you can use past and, and what you can for present, but what's the future? That's assumptions. And uh, I guess I look myself at the loss potential when this was supposed to happen 50, 60 years ago uh, and how much has been lost because it didn't go through a change of thinking, a change of government, whatever caused that. Um, but ultimately to say now, well, let's, let's shelf it again, uh, would be, uh, terrible in my eyes for the sake of, again, we have a, uh, a, uh, industry that's in its infancy. There's huge amount of potential as an irrigator myself with the crops that I grow continually get calls of, you know, why can't we purchase more or where can we find more? Uh, there is all those kinds of opportunities. Uh, when it comes to the crops we grow, but also the crops that we currently aren't growing because we don't have the processing capacity or or, uh, or the current critical mass within those acres to sustain secondary processing. Jeff, can I put a couple of listener emails to you? I just want to hear sure. how you would respond to these. So we got a note from Walter who writes, I strongly disagree with the proposed $1.15 billion irrigation project. And then he, he lays out three points. One, this amount of money would pay for 1,600 healthcare employees for a period of five years. Number two, this amount of money invested at our current rate of 4% would amount to billions of dollars, including compound interest. Number three, if Saskatchewan had a better relationship with the federal government than they have now, they would certainly donate a large sum if their professionals agreed with the proposal. So three like very different points there, but just wondering if you want to... Uh, take it from there and, and sort of how you would engage with with Walter. Yeah, certainly. I mean, obviously, government, first of all, has to has a juggling act. They, you know, they deal with multiple industries with multiple uh, things, whether that's healthcare, education, whatever. And that's a balancing act that elected officials have to deal with. And I certainly am not going to touch on, you know, the fact that, well, all the money should go to one place or another, because uh, certainly it has to be shared out and how they've divvied that out uh, is up to them. That being said, all industries are, are pulling for for a piece of that pie, as, as one would say. Uh, to the second question, can you relay the second question again, sorry? Yeah, so you, the, number two says, this amount of money invested at our current rate of 4% would amount to billions of dollars, including compound interest. Sure, no, and well, I guess I wouldn't really touch on that either because I don't know too many governments that are doing saving, they do all the spendings, but uh, that being said, maybe the savings would be in tax dollars if that was the case, instead of shelling them out, uh, we should be retaining them as individuals, but won't, won't dig into that one too far either. But the last one is a little more intriguing to me. If Saskatchewan had a, had a better relationship with the federal government than they have now, they would certainly donate a large sum if their professionals agreed with the proposal. Because that's the and missing piece right now, right? Is the, the province is asking the federal government or wants to ask the federal government to pay for some of this. I think that's that's my understanding. Yeah. No, there is some intention there. Absolutely. And I mean, we would all say that. I mean, myself, I see that, that this is a benefit to Canadians as well. This is going to go well beyond our borders. Um, and certainly I wish they would view it as an economic driver for, for the country as well. Uh, as far as the, again, digging into politics, uh, I'm not going to touch that one. But uh, the reality is that, yes, there, there is conflict there. And again, that arises from multi, multiple edges and sides and people. And, and yeah, certainly if we could iron that out, uh, I think there is an opportunity there. And I would hope that maybe at some point that will still come. You know that a lot of people are wrestling with this one. Like, you know, we, this is, I think, our, our third show uh, in the last mm -hmm. year on, on this project. And like, we've got callers waiting to get on, several emails. And so j for those who are wrestling with this and trying to figure out, you know, is this something the province should move forward with? What, what, what's the final piece um, that you want to leave with people to understand your perspective on it? Yeah, I guess, well, one of the biggest things to me, I guess, would be the fact that what is one of our largest economic drivers in this province? Well, it's agriculture. And ultimately, yeah, we can continue producing on dry land. And as a producer, we're doing the best we can to produce the highest quality food we can in the world and, and get it uh, into export. Uh, but also now there's a new opportunity in my eyes, and that is sustaining for our own, whether that's within this province or within this country, in that we want to produce 
healthy, fresh food for individuals to pick up in the grocery store instead of bringing it in from afar. How, 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 realistic, how realistic is that, Jeff? And we don't have a ton of time. I want to get to David Shield, who's got our news headlines. But just to give people a better understanding of it, you mentioned potatoes. But yeah. what, what really would this project enable people to grow? Well, well let's start with who uh, travels to the local farmer's market. Because everything you can get there can be produced under a pivot in the sprouts. Um what, within season, obviously. And, uh, so there's everything be from seasonal. squash to broccoli to... Absolutely, yeah. No, and I would encourage anybody to go visit uh, Outlook Saskatchewan and ask some questions and you'd be pointed in a direction. There's, there's new facilities being built there. There's new processors, or not processors, sorry, producers being moved into that area that are emphasizing on that and are looking to get direct to grocery uh, type of stuff done. And like I said, a big piece of this too that's missed in the report, I guess, is the fact that, yeah, we say it could be 50 farmers. Well, that is absolutely unknown. And the fact is there's entrepreneurs that are waiting for the opportunity to do a UPEC or do a, you know, there's all kinds of opportunity when it comes to water and producing food. And the fact is too that the consumer is interested in knowing where their food comes from and also if they can get it locally and how it's produced. And just to clarify for people, because you yeah. already have irrigation, like you don't you won't personally benefit from the expansion of this project. Like when you talk to us and clearly you, you, <laughs> you feel strongly about moving forward with this, but you're not going to benefit from this. Other people potentially might, but you're, you're, you've already got your, your thing. Correct. No, I am south of the area that would be considered being under consideration for the development. So no, it does not have any effect on me. Uh, I'm 100% behind it because of the fact that it's growing an industry, an industry that I'm a part of, but also I see the huge benefit that it is to those communities. So that's the other spinoff I'd like to add to this as I come from a small community, one that just about dried up and didn't exist. I mean, the school closed, the stores of more of all of us closed. <clears throat> but now we're seeing a resurgence of people uh, due to the increased amount of productivity that happens here because of irrigation. So we have a potato operation that employs multiples. Uh, we have crop input dealers and farm machinery dealers, electricians. That side of things has started to pick up in our community. Now you look at somewhere where they're going to add 90,000 acres. I mean, again, take a, take a look across the river at Outlook and see what the kind of community that is, because it would look like the community I come from if it wasn't for irrigation in my eyes. You're listening to Blue Sky here on CBC Radio 1. I'm Lee Sugarbinski. I'm speaking with Jeff Ewan, co-chair of Irrigation Saskatchewan. And we've got callers standing by and another guest to uh, chime in on this topic. We're, we're looking at the, ex- the potential expansion of the Diefenbaker Irrigation Project. Jeff, I just want to get just to put a couple more questions to you because you're painting a really important picture uh, that's helping us understand what it is you're doing in, in your part of the province. Just remind me what you're growing that you wouldn't be able to grow without irrigation. What are the crops that you've got right now? So so our crop rotation is we do grow a cereal crop. So typically that's durum, which would be produced into pasta. Uh, We would then grow canola, which is, again, the vegetable oil, or the oilseed portion of the rotation. And then we grow dry edible beans, which is something that you typically will not see anywhere but under irrigation, at least in Saskatchewan. Uh, and again, that can be a dry consumed or, or in a can. Um, but those are the three main crops. We do actually grow uh, flaxseed as well. Um, there is potato operations within the area, but they typically rotate into acres uh, due to the fact that they can be only grown every four years for disease reasons. Right, so, so one year you plant potatoes, too. but then you'd have to plant flax the next year, something else, something else. And then... Correct. You still follow a crop rotation, and that's for due to disease reasons. So yes, to say that well, ninety thousand acres, and there could be ninety thousand acres of potatoes. No, that's not that's not a reality. Help, fact me, is... help me understand though that if you are growing canola, flax, <laughs> we're growing that in lots of parts of the province. So what makes your situation unique? Like we keep hearing about value added crops, but for, and I'm not a, I'm not a farmer, so I, to me that sounds like what's growing everywhere else. Yeah, well, it's the fact that you do need that rotation, and regardless, you need to have that cereal crop in there for disease breakdown. Also, a piece that's missed out of this, too, is the livestock industry and the fact that, you know, forages could be included in that, and that then adds feedlots, potentially dairy, you know, those types of things or spinoffs as well, that certain portions of that, if that's what the producers that buy in or are currently located in those areas want to do as, as, as their business, well, that certainly works. I mean, there's... There's also uh, hog 
production, those types of things can all spill off of of uh, irrigation as well. Okay. Well, Jeff, you're welcome to stay with us until one o'clock. Uh, there might be a question from a caller that's a good one for you. So if you want to sit back and listen for a bit, you can. If you have to run, it's okay. But um, I so want to get to it. will hang around. You'll hang around? Okay. I've got a Thanks. couple of callers. Let's go to James in Saskatoon. Hello there, James. Hey, how's it going? Good. What are your thoughts? Hello. I, I, I personally think it's a fantastic idea. Uh, you know, the, the, the thing that I think many people except for maybe Jeff truly understand is entrepreneurship is, is is built and predicated on the whole idea of seeing value where others do not. And, and, and I, I always think back to my first year of university when one of my uh, economist uh, uh, professors taught me that it, it, how often do you see uh, economists run successful at business enterprise? You don't because the, they, often uh, tear it apart so many times that they'll never take that first step to actually see true value added. And that's where it, it was always an interesting blend. But, but to your question, I think maybe what you're kind of wondering about, uh, Lisa, also, is was you speak of these crops that we also can produce, the flaxes and what have you. But what it really does is it, 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 is it super boosts um, our, our, our crop capacity, right? It turns everything in that area to a more highly productive uh, agricultural business, right? And, and all of that lends itself to just having more revenue, more, more taxation to, to build upon, building added value to the farmland itself. And, and the fact of the matter is, is that I think the other subtext that not a lot of people are putting enough consideration to is that Alberta is, is constantly looking at this water right, right? And if we don't utilize our water right, somebody will take it away from us. So there is that consideration as well. So I, I think if you take a, a look at it from the totality of the whole, there truly is, uh, from an entrepreneurial standpoint, a lot of value that can be raised through this. Okay. So I, I, I just wanted to give the, some of that voice to to the consideration to this. So I thank you so much for your time. Yeah, and I appreciate that, James. Thank you. Have a good day. You, you too. You can call us, 1-800-716-2221. You can also email bluesky at cbc.ca. Tristan Skolrud is an ag economist at the College of Agriculture at the University of Saskatchewan. He's been listening, and he joins us now. Tristan, welcome to Blue Sky. Hi, Alicia. Thanks for having me. So what's your take on what we've heard so far? <laughs> Well, I understand there's lots of uh, different perspectives. And as an economist I, and uh, colleague of uh, Peter Phillips, I, I do understand what he's saying, and I, I agree with most of it. I do think that some of the economists that have weighed in on this as a, um, a problem of ROI and return on investment, I think that's missing the point a little bit. I mean, of course, it doesn't even come close to hitting that, depending on how you measure it. But, you know, a government has a lot of different roles. That's something that Jeff alluded to, too, as well, that um, it's not just about choosing the investments with the best possibility of returning tax revenue. It's about providing services and providing markets where there are missing markets. And, and this is a good example of a missing market, right? It wouldn't make sense for any one producer to try and do irrigation, put all the infrastructure in by themselves, but it might make sense for the government to do it if lots could benefit. So I just want to ask you about that, because that's the yeah. other point of contention. Who's going to benefit? How many people are going to benefit? So when you say lots could benefit, how would you, what's your take on that? Like, Oh, yeah. <laughs> so what I'm saying is that there are other ways to view this, this whole idea other than ROI. But in this particular case, it's still awful when you look at the other stuff. You know, we're talking about 50 farmers um, possibly gaining from this. And... I want to go back to that KPMG report, you know, the, these big GDP numbers that they're putting out is predicated upon these food processors coming. And uh, I, I agree with Peter Phillips in thinking that that's really not going to happen. Right now in the Lake Diefenbaker irrigation area, there's very, very few potatoes grown. I understand the rotation concerns, but one of the bigger reasons it's not grown is because there, we haven't hit that critical mass of potato production to warrant a processor coming in. Right. We've got, I believe, about, if I look here, about 7,000 acres of potatoes in this 
in this province relative to Alberta is about 80,000 acres. Oh, wow. And doubling our potato acre acreage is not going to all of a sudden pull a processor in. It's and, just not going to happen. And like when we say a, a processor, and sorry <laughs> if I'm simplifying this too much, but are, you, are we talking about like a, a company that would make chips? You know, like, what, like you know, you've got a raw product and then they turn it into something. When we say yeah. we want to attract more food processing to Saskatchewan, what do, what do we mean by that? Yeah, you're exactly right. It's someone that takes that raw product, that actual potato, and transforms it into something that can go further up the supply chain and be delivered to a consumer. You bet. So, okay, so just so I'm clear on on this, because on one hand, if we expand the project, then we would be growing more potatoes. We would. So, Probably. yeah. So, so what what do you think then? Is is this a smart move? No. No. Um, if the proportions of potato growing stay the same as we have in our current irrigated acres, and around Lake, Lake Deep and Baker, there's about 120,000 acres. And like I said, about 7,000 of those go to potatoes. So if we add another 90,000, let's say that's almost doubling the size of the Lake Deep and Baker Irrigation District. So let's say we almost double the potato acreage. It's just not enough to warrant a processor. You know, think about what this processor is how they're making their decisions. Do they really want to go to a place where production is so low, it's geographically isolated, and the potential for increases in production is minimal until even more acres become irrigated? How it's else, a very, very dubious proposition. Yeah, so how else could the government be spending that money that might benefit oh, egg man. producers in Saskatchewan? There's such a big list. And I and Jeff, I'm sure, has a, has lots of other ideas as well. And and I was actually thinking about this the other day. You know, if you if you went to the crop production show, for example, and you said, "Hey, guess what? We have a billion dollars to spend on agriculture," which, by the way, is about how much our government spends per year on the ag sector. So we're talking about a big chunk of money. Okay, if you went around and talked to farmers and said, "Okay, list the things that you would want the government to do," I bet irrigation for 50 farmers wouldn't even make the top 10 unless you happen to grab one of those 50 farmers or somebody that's already in an irrigated district that might stand stand to benefit from the presence of more processors but to answer your question what would i do um i would invest in climate adaptation measures drought or excuse me irrigation technically is a climate adaptation measure but it's a climate adaptation measure for 50 people you could invest in climate adaptation measures for the 60 million acres of Saskatchewan farmland that we have. I don't know if the, all the listeners understand just the, the size and the scope of Saskatchewan farming, but 60 million acres of total farmland versus 90,000. That's less than, way less than 1% that we're talking about. So why not take that billion and let all of those 60 million acres start to get on the road to adapting to a changing climate. And that's just one. There's, there's tons of other issues in the ag sector that money at this scale could do. We could put it in market development. We could put it in mental health counseling. We could put it in um, better extension services. We could put it in rebuilding the transportation network. There's so many different things. So why do you think the provincial government is so set on this? <laughs> I have no idea, honestly. You know, the our um, our current government wants to be the party of agriculture, and they're really hanging their hat on that. And um, you know, if if I was the one making the decisions for them, I would do something that stood to benefit more producers rather than just hanging my hat on the the very very small chance that this ninety thousand acre investment you know, has these cascading impacts of starting this whole new food processing sector. I just don't see it. Okay, let's go to a couple of callers that we've got on the line. So Fred joins us right now in Dundurn. Fred, welcome to Blue Sky. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think a lot of the comments that are made on this are missing the point of what's going on here. Our world population is ever-increasing, we're talking about global warming where our climate is warming up. We've just gone through five years of drought in a major part of Saskatchewan. And as far as this irrigation project being brand new, 
this project started back in nineteen in the nineteen fifties when the Gardner Dam was designed, and a lot of the infrastructure that is going to be adapted to these new new areas of flooding were on the books back in nineteen sixty seven they just never got never got finished and all they're doing is continuing on with the initial project that was started back in the nineteen sixties uh Another point I'd like to make is the fact that if we if we live by what our economists told us, I don't think we'd get too far. Uh, we got a four-lane highway all the way from the Manitoba border up to Lloydminster. Uh, if that was built on the economics of an economist saying, what's our, our return investment, those highways would never be built. We have to build an infrastructure for our province to grow on, and agriculture is the lifeblood of this province. I'm in a small irrigation pocket off the Blackstrap Reservoir in the Seuss Canal, and and uh, the development of new pivots in this area is is quite extensive for the simple reason that farmers are getting sick and tired of having drought, hmm. and the potential for for new markets. Sure, it's going to take a bit. You go back to Alberta that started their irrigation, I think, in the late 40s, early 50s. They never had all those food processing plants built right off the bat. They grew into it. And if we don't start growing, start increasing our productivity here, we're never going to get to that point. We stand back and wait, well, I'm not going to make any money on this today, so I'm not going to do it. This is a 50-year project, so... What's going to happen in 50 years? I don't know, but I know darn well that the population isn't going to decrease and and the potential of farming. There's no more farmland to be uh, to be developed, so we have to develop the land we've got. And irrigation definitely is an in, an asset to developing more production okay. within our economy. Fred, I appreciate you calling. Thank you. Okay, thank you. It's Fred and Dundurn. Tristan, do you want to pick up on anything there? We often we hear those the Alberta comparison a lot, and I don't know if it's apples yeah, to sure. oranges, but yeah, I mean I understand some of the points that he's making. Um, you know, the idea that yeah, if you don't start at start somewhere, then you're never going to get to that minimum efficient scale where all of a sudden people want to start coming in, and I mean, and and that is a, a valid argument, but the point I think is that. If you're going to spend money to encourage agricultural development, there are more effective ways of doing it. I think that's that's the the main takeaway that I would that I would provide. And I would also, um, uh, you know, remind our our listeners that uh, fifty in a fifty year population projections are actually not to increase. We're actually expecting to hit a peak and then start mm-hmm. to go down. And we have had enough food to feed the world since the 1980s or so. Wow. Okay, let's yeah. go to another caller, Wayne and Swift Current. Welcome to Blue Sky, Wayne. Yes, yeah, so, um, numbers don't make sense here. The net benefit will not even come close to the the overall uh, investment that the government's proposing. And I'll just say boondoggle number three. Here we go again, another billion-dollar investment, and we, the taxpayers, are going to be on the foot for it. So good luck, everybody. <laughs> what are the others? <laughs> you know, I was going to tell people, we, we, we had a previous show about Spudco, which was an attempt to have a potato processing plant um, related to yep. Dave and Baker. Is that what you're referring to? Uh, no, I'm talking about the transportation hub. Oh. I'm talking about the Regina Bypass. I'm talking about the billions of dollars that this current administration has spent. Well, I got to wait with my 85-year-old mother in the emergency room for eight and a half hours. Priorities. We don't need this. This is about needs and wants, and this is a want. This isn't a need. This administration has lost its vision. Wayne, I appreciate you calling. Thank Thank you. Tristan, do you want to add anything, or do you want me to go to another email? <laughs> no, I, I I understand his frustration, and I'm gonna I'm gonna add to his frustration a little bit um, with some more numbers that provide some context. 
the um, let's say hypothetically the processors don't come okay and so that the only direct benefit of this is for those 50 farmers this would be paying twelve thousand eight hundred dollars per acre for those farmers which would be about over 21 million dollars per farm and that how, how much of a concern is that I think it's a huge concern. I mean, I I think people should be outraged by this. Are people talking about this? We're in the the middle of an election campaign. The the value of land and and what this irrigation project could do to the, to the the price tag attached to farmland. How much are people talking about that? Um, you know, it's people are talking about farmland prices uh, a lot. Not necessarily because of this, because the scale of this is so small. It doesn't sound like it should be when you're talking about a billion dollars, but really we're talking about um, 50 farms at 1,700 acres per farm. Um, but, you know, the first and the most immediate effect if this policy goes through is it's going to increase the value of the farmland in that area. And um, that's one of the main things that we hear people complaining about is not being able to farm uh, because farmland values are going too high. What if, what if instead of spending a billion dollars on this, the SAS government said, hey, we are going to finance loans for new farmers to get into Saskatchewan. We're going to provide collateral like the federal government does. You know, there's another hypothetical option for a way to use this money that could be um, more beneficial to young farmers in an election year who care about increasing farmland prices. You know, another thing that comes up whenever we have this conversation about the the project, the proposed project, is the environmental impact. And I wanted to share an email from Kathy. We have done previous shows on this where we've, we've heard from Indigenous communities very concerned. But I thought you're, I haven't talked to you yet, Tristan, about this. And mm-hmm. maybe you have thoughts. And if you don't, that's okay. But Kathy writes... Um, So she wants me to ask deeply about further effects of the proposed irrigation project, uh, asking about how the project is projected to affect the Saskatchewan River system, especially the Cumberland Delta area. What conversations have occurred, particularly with First Nations communities? Now, I know you can't answer that part of it, but I'm wondering if you're looking at the environmental impact of it as a whole. Yeah, I know a little bit about the hydrology issues and from the KPMG report and other related reports, you know, they're basically trying to ensure the public that the amount of water that we're talking about taking away from Lake Diefenbaker isn't enough to create these huge environmental uh, issues. That's what they're saying. I'm not validating that. Mm -hmm. But I do know that our need for irrigation is highest during drought. So when we have really, really low water levels, that's when the need for irrigation is highest. And that will definitely exacerbate water flow and hydrology problems. Because you know, okay. we, don't, we don't need irrigation when, it's, when we have when a lot of when we have rain. Right. Uh, okay, I just want to go to another caller here. Cam in Pangman joins us right now. Hi, Cam. Welcome to Blue Sky. Wow, thanks for fitting me in. I wasn't sure if I'd get in. And that was exactly perfect because I was going to say, you guys really are talking about the environmental effects of this, and I just don't think the water system can take any more drainage by human use. I don't think it's a good idea just from the environmental standpoint of the whole thing. That was my point, and you were just talking about it. Like we were reading each other's minds. Is there, uh, are, do you farm, or is there a particular... No, but I guess I would call myself a lefty environmental person. I care about First Nations people. I care about the water. I care about the birds, the fish, the insects, the salamanders, the frogs. And they're all under a lot of stress with the way this farming is being done. And I don't think we need to put any stress on those poor things. We need to learn to live in balance with nature, not constantly sucking it dry. Okay, well, Cam, thanks for calling. You bet. That's Cam and Pangman. I want to quickly fit in uh, what we heard from Scott Moe, the leader of the Saskatchewan Party, because this obviously came up and he was able to share his party's thoughts on this. The whole premise around the the Diefenbaker Lake expansion is really building off uh, the very original intent of why that reservoir was built. 
um, uh, back in its day. And that was, uh, uh, it was an initiative that was put forward, uh, not only by the provincial government, but by Ralph Goodale and the federal government as well. Um, and it's an initiative that is uh, focused on uh, a number of different priorities. Um, I believe the report will focus on one. Uh, what one is uh, expanding the value of the crops that we grow through agricultural irrigation. Yes, that's true. Uh, to increase the value of the crops that we grow and increase the food security uh, that we provide, um, and already provide, I think, in, in, uh, in, to a, a great number of countries, over 160 countries around the, the world, but to increase the value per acre of the crops we're growing. That's one. Two is to increase uh, the opportunities for water security into our municipal communities, in particular our larger municipal, municipal communities, for uh, literally decades if not centuries into the future. Saskatoon, Regina, all growing communities. Um, and when you look at the various phases uh, that were put forward by uh, the original report by, uh, that was done uh, through, I believe, Western Economic Diversification uh, with uh, Ralph Goodale uh, uh, involved, uh, the federal government and the provincial government, um, water security for those large uh, growing communities in our province uh, is paramount. Um, and third, I would say that there's also an added uh, water security piece that we need for the industries that are employing people in, the, in Saskatchewan. Uh, the potash mining industry, the uh, value-added agriculture industry, which is adding value today through protein fractionation, through uh, canola crush plants that we're seeing built. They need water security as well in order to uh, make the investment, and many times they're, they're international companies, many times they're uh, investments uh, that, are, that are being derived right from people that are living in Saskatchewan. But they need water security in order to, uh, to make those investments, in order to uh, increase uh, the, the value-add that we're bringing to the ag community so that we're exporting ingredients as opposed to uh, just raw agricultural products and uh, most importantly to uh, create the jobs uh, in the communities and we were in Lorburn where they're doing protein fractionation an investment there creating jobs we see uh, the investment that AGT has made in the Davidson area in protein fractionation I was in Humboldt at a similar plant the other day and we're all aware of the doubling uh, on new investments into the canola crush space and so uh, it is about water security not only for irrigation and advancing and increasing the value of the of the crops uh, that we are producing, getting to, uh, uh, you know, to vegetable crops and things as opposed to wheat and canola. Um, but it's also about municipal water security for growing vibrant cities uh, and communities. And it's also about water security for the industries that are creating jobs for the people that are living uh, in those urban centres as well. Gins, to respond to the leader of the Saskatchewan party there, what are your final words yeah. that you want to share? Maybe if you care about water security, stop promoting policies that drain wetlands. This isn't going to create jobs other than for the people that have to build this thing. Okay, we're going to leave it there. This has been a really awesome conversation. I've learned from all of you. So Tristan, thanks. Yep, you bet. Tristan Skullrud is an ag economist at the College of Agriculture at the University of Saskatchewan. Jeff Ewan, still on the line. He's been listening. And a huge thanks to him. He's co-chair of Sask Irrigation. I'm Lisa Gravinsky. You've been listening to Blue Sky. 